Thank you for joining us today for the IPRO-H Quick, Advancing the Culture of Safety, Strategies to Prevent Collapsing and Caudi. Today's session will be recorded. Next slide, please. So during today's session, we'll be using the chat feature of WebEx. Please be sure to put your, uh, your any questions or comments into chat. You'll see uh, a two box. Uh, please make sure that in the two box, you've selected everyone, and that will be sure that the messages are shared with uh, all attendees. Next slide, please. Well, thank you. Uh, and again, welcome. I am Becky Boll, uh, director of the H Quick program, and I have the pleasure today to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Priscilla Ibone. Priscilla is a patient safety subject matter expert for the iPro H Quick. Priscilla provides patient safety expertise to healthcare systems and organizations to advance the culture of patient safety and innovations at the point of care. With 15 years of RN bedside patient care experience, Priscilla has practiced in the areas of home health care, acute care hospitals, hospice care, rehabilitation, and post-acute care settings. Priscilla is passionate about improving patient safety, which has motivated her to facilitate these quarterly lunch and learns. Our next speaker will be Justin Cowdell, who is an infection preventionist from Jackson, Kentucky, and serves as the Regional Director of Infection Prevention for the Appalachian Regional Healthcare. Before joining ARH in 2019, Justin practiced emergency medicine for nearly a decade in facilities across the United States. Next slide, please. James Hen Hensley is an infection preventionist from Hazard, Kentucky, and serves as a system director of infection prevention at Appalachian Regional Healthcare. James is certified in infection control and currently serves as a member of the Kentucky Sepsis Consortium and advisory boards for K-Stripe and the Kentucky Infection Prevention Training Center. Amanda Taylor is the system epidemiologist of the application, uh, excuse me, uh, application regional healthcare system and team lead of the ARH centralized surveillance program. In a role as system epidemiologist, Amanda has successfully developed the organization's first centralized surveillance program to provide standardization, increase data validity and reliability, and increase the floor presence of facility infection preventionists. Again, I'd like to welcome today's speakers and now I'll turn it over to Priscilla. All right, thanks so much, Becky, for that great introduction. So I'll first of all start by talking about what the H Quick is. It is a hospital quality improvement contractor um, being contracted by the CMS, and they partner with small, royal, or critical access hospitals to lead and develop um, quality improvement projects that are designed to help to improve um, all the safety concerns that are being mentioned on the ring, as you can see on the screen, pressure injuries, hospital acquired infections, sepsis, readmissions, and all the things that are being listed on the ring. So um, they provide um, assistance with tw over 12 states in the United States, which are listed at the bottom of the, of the slide. Next slide. As you can see, here is the map of the states that are being covered by our H Quick program. Next slide. So in today's presentation, we will learn um, the prevalence of CLAPSI and Cloudy, the causative factors and evidence-based strategies for CLAPSI and Cloudy prevention. And also we have our fabulous team here from the Appalachian Healthcare System that have successfully implemented evidence-based strategies and they had a significant decrease in their CLAPSI and CLAUDI rates. So thanks for joining us to share your um, best practices. Next slide. So why do we focus on preventing CLAPSI? So CLAPSI is actually a national patient safety priority and is estimated about 30,000 CLAPSI cases occur every year. It is um, preventable 
and when essential prevention uh, infection prevention practices are accurately followed. You can see the percentage for the mortality rate for CLAPS. It ranges from 12 to 25 percent, and this significantly increases is cost and hospital length of stay. As you all know, cost is really, really involved when we have these infections. So next slide. And also as far as Caudi, Caudi um, uh, um, Catheter Association Urinary Tract Infection and approximately 75% are associated with urinary catheter. And you can see from the statistics, between 15 to 25 percent of our hospitalized patients do end up receiving urinary catheter of any form during their hospital stay. So the most important risk for developing um, cowardly is prolonged use of these catheters for, um, for our patient. So um, catheters should only be used for appropriate um, indications and should be removed as soon as they are no longer needed. And the data at the bottom is from CMS. You can see the cost, 16,256. 16, Next slide. So one thing we always don't want to leave out is our patient and family. We want to always involve them in, in the care of our patients. So the patient and family should alert the staff members if they notice that the central line dressing is either coming off or is becoming wet, they should be empowered to actually speak up on these practices. Patient and family should also um, be empowered to be speaking up with to our healthcare team who are not appropriately providing hand hygiene before providing either line care or fully care or any form of care. So we want to empower these um, special um, care partners to be able to help us to prevent the spread of this infection, the occurrence of this infection. And they should they themselves too should be educated on proper hand hygiene technique before and after leaving their loved ones' rooms. Next slide. So after talking about what our patients can do, so at this point, I want to turn over to our healthcare system, Appalachian Health, who have actually successfully implemented some CLAPSI and CAUDI practices, and they are really willing to share with us. So um, James and team, you can take it over. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Priscilla. Uh, so next slide, please. All right, uh, James here. Um, you know, before we get into our presentation on class and college prevention, I always like to give a quick background on our organization and the context for our improvement initiatives. So, uh, ARH was formed in 1956 as uh, the Coal Miners Memorial Hospital Association. Uh, changed our name in '86 to Appalachian Regional Healthcare uh, to better describe our far-ranging service. Uh, ARH is a not-for-profit health system. We're operating 14 hospitals and various facilities, including inpatient behavioral health, LTAC, skilled nursing. So those multi-specialty physician practices, home health, all those. Uh, we serve a unique population, uh, some of the lowest income areas in the United States uh, with higher than average rates of comorbidities as well as a high IV drug abuse population. So in 2022, we embarked on a major restructuring journey in infection prevention. So uh, as you all know, the pandemic placed unique stresses upon infection prevention departments nationwide. You know, that highlights both our value, which was great. <laughs> so you know, we were in the forefront but also as, as well as our expertise as infection preventionists, but we also highlighted deficiencies in staffing, structure, and department efficiency. You know, so to move forward, we had to be objective, assess process and practice, and step away from our current environment and accept that IP needed a change to meet the needs of the post-pandemic environment. So we approached with the one team, one goal mentality. You know, we chose to systemize our department, enhance the uniformity of mission and uh, accountability across our organization. So. Uh, we created regional roles to enhance support and team building, create redundancy, and a defined career pathway for IPs. And uh, you know, one of our major goals was to get IPs out of the office and back at the bedside. You know, if you're going to prevent collapses and cotties, uh, you know, you have to be out there and and looking at these devices and doing that just in time education with staff. You know, we also implemented that centralized surveillance program as mentioned earlier, uh, leading to a large increase in our floor presence. And as and we implemented some standardized auditing, digital auditing with communication automation and data analysis. Uh, system wide. So, you know, these improvements have led us to major successes in multiple of our IP objectives, uh, which we'll discuss later. But with that being said, I'll turn it over to Amanda to begin our presentation. Uh, she'll discuss the CLABC and CAUTI surveillance process. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, James. Today, I will be discussing how our surveillance team identifies healthcare associated infections 
specifically Clabsy and Cotty. At ARH, we have a dedicated team of infection preventionists that perform all surveillance activities for all facilities within the system using NHSN standardized definitions and methods. This process may look very different for each of your organizations and may even vary among different facilities within your organization. You might have a dedicated team or a single infection preventionist that performs your surveillance activities. Regardless of how this process looks at your facility, it's important that whoever is conducting surveillance has sufficient training to correctly perform HAI identification. The data has to be correct in order to know where the problem really lies. Each team member of our surveillance team is required to complete ongoing NHSN training through annual training, as well as other trainings that are released throughout the year to ensure team members are as up to date as possible with NHSN guidelines, any new changes that have been made, as well as upcoming changes. The team reviews all positive cultures daily and promptly identifies HAIs. These HAIs are then communicated swiftly to the local and regional infection preventionists, along with any identified lapses in infection prevention. For example, maybe a patient is admitted with fever and hypertension, but a blood culture isn't performed until hospital day four. Once the HAI has been communicated, the surveillance team sends a request to the local IP for a root cause analysis to be performed in conjunction with the unit manager um, the HAI was attributed to, thereby initiating the RCA process. The IP and unit manager review the findings from the RCA with local and system leadership at the next RCA meeting. We have those monthly. Our surveillance team also monitors CLABZ and CAUTI standardized infection ratios and device utilization rates to assess prevention progress over time and to target prevention activities. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is a CLABZ? A CLABZ is a central line associated bloodstream infection. NHSN defines a CLABZ as a primary laboratory confirmed bloodstream infection in a patient with a central line in place greater than two days on the date of event and either still in place on the date of event or removed the day prior to the date of event. At this point, you have already ruled out a secondary BSI and now need to know if CLABSI criteria is met. Next slide, please. There are several CLABSI classifications. All criteria must be met within the infection window period, which includes the specimen collection date and the three calendar days before and three calendar days after collection date. First, let's look at LCBI 1, 2, and 3. LCBI 1 involves a patient of any age and requires at least one recognized pathogen to be identified from one or more blood specimens obtained by culture or identified to the genus or species level by non-culture-based microbiologic testing. No symptoms are required to meet LCBI 1 criteria. This is a common misconception that symptoms are required However, to meet the LCBI-1 CLABSI criteria, you only have to have the recognized pathogen. Even if symptoms are present, they cannot be used to set the date of event. The date of event will always be the collection date of the first positive blood specimen when meeting the criteria. LCBI-2 involves a patient of any age and requires the same NHSN common commensal organisms to be identified by culture from two or more blood specimens that are collected on separate occasions and have at least one of the following symptoms. So fever, which is defined as greater than 104 degrees Fahrenheit, chills, and hypotension. The collection date sets the infection window period, and the first element met during the infection window period sets the date of event for this type of CLABZ. LCBI-3 involves only patients that are less than or equal to one year of age and requires the same common commensal organisms identified by a culture from two or more blood specimens collected on separate occasions, and at least one of the following symptoms, so fever, hypothermia, apnea, or bradycardia. Next slide, please. Once you have met your LCBI, one, two, or three criteria, you need to determine if your mucosal barrier injury or MBI criteria is met. So for your MBI, LCBI one criteria, it's met when a patient meets the LCBI-1 criteria and has only intestinal organisms from the NHSN MBI organism list identified. This list can be accessed on their website. And patient is either an allogeneic 
ectopoietic stem cell transplant recipient within the past year with either grade three or four um, GI graft versus host disease or has greater than or equal to one liter of diarrhea in a 24 hour period or greater than or equal to 20 milliliters per kilogram for patients under the age of 18 with onset on or within the seven calendar days before the date the positive blood specimen was collected or is neutropenic, which is defined as at least two separate days with absolute neutrophil count and or your white blood cell values less than 500 cells per cubic millimeter within the seven day infection window period. To meet your MBI <clears throat> LCBI2 criteria, the patient must first meet the LCBI2 criteria and only have viridens, group streptococcus, and or urothia species identified and will meet either the one or two criteria as listed in your MBI LCBI1. And then finally, your MBI LCBI3 criteria is met when the patient meets LCBI3 criteria and only have viridens group streptococcus and or rothia species identified and meets either that one or two criteria as listed above. Next slide. This flow chart here is included as a resource for identifying CLABSIs and comes from the CDC. First, you start with a positive blood culture. Then you have to determine if the patient meets criteria for an infection at another site. If the patient does meet infection criteria at another site with at least one organism that matches the other site specimen, then the blood is ruled a secondary BSI. If there isn't a matching organism present, then it is ruled a primary BSI. On the other hand, if you answer no to an infection being present at a different site, then you need to determine if it is healthcare or community associated. If healthcare associated criteria is met, the CLABSI is reported to NHSN. If community associated criteria is met instead, it is not reported. Next slide. Now let's talk about CAUTI. This is a catheter associated urinary tract infection. A CAUTI is a confirmed UTI in a patient with an indwelling urinary catheter in place for greater than two days on the date of event and either still in place on the date of event or removed the day prior to the date of event. Next slide. There are three CAUTI classifications. First, you have your SUD1, which is a symptomatic UTI in a patient of any age with at least one of the following symptoms, fever, suprapubic tenderness and or costo vertebral angle pain or tenderness with no other recognized cause documented by the physician or urinary urgency, frequency and or dysuria, none of which can be used when the indwelling urinary catheter is in place. And the patient has a urine culture with no more than two species of organisms identified, at least one of which is a bacterium of 100,000 CFU per milliliter. So it's important to remember that even though the urgency, frequency, and dysuria cannot be used to meet criteria when the catheter is in place. If the catheter is removed and the next day the patient experiences those symptoms, it could still be attributed to the catheter that had been in, in place because you can still meet that criteria the day after it has been removed. SUDI2 is a symptomatic UTI in a patient less than or equal to one year of age with at least one of the following symptoms fever, hypothermia, or apnea, bradycardia, lethargy, vomiting, or suprapubic tenderness with no other recognized cause documented by the physician. And the patient has a urine culture meeting the same requirements as SUD1. So at least your one bacterium of 100,000 CFUs with no more than two species being present. Lastly, we have a booty. This is an asymptomatic bacteremic UTI where the patient has no symptoms of SUD1 or 2 present according to age and has a urine culture with at least one bacterium of 100,000 CFU with no more than two species being present. And the patient has organism identified from a blood specimen with at least one matching bacterium to the bacterium at 100,000 CFU identified in the urine specimen or the patient is eligible for your LCBI criteria two without fever, because remember fever is a symptom of a UTI and no UTI symptoms can be present to meet the booty definition. So maybe the patient met LCBI two criteria with hypotension or chills, but didn't have that fever. 
and those common commensals have to match what is in the urine. Um, the CDC does have a good flow chart for identifying CAUTI on their website. If you want to check it out, it was too large to include on these slides. Next slide, please. This concludes my portion of the presentation. All of this information can be found on the NHSN website within the 2023 Patient Safety Component Manual. Thank you. Jane? Yes, appreciate that. Next slide, please. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump to the next one. We we already heard about the impact from uh, Priscilla. All right, so I'm going to jump into what is the central line, right? So a central line is an intravascular device that terminates at or close to the heart of one of the great vessels. So we're talking about things like non-tunnel CVCs, uh, you know, which you're going to think about more commonly your your single lumen, triple lumen catheters, things like that. Uh, often places of clavian, jugular, femoral sites. Uh, your tunnel CVCs, dialysis catheters. Uh, your PIC lines, so your peripherally inserted central catheters, as well as implanted ports. Next slide, please. Uh, so why is an invasive device high risk? So, you know, you, many of you are very familiar with the chain of infection, uh, the classic, right? Uh, invasive devices are, are high risk. You know, they themselves don't cause infections, but they provide a route for bacteria and fungi to enter the body. So you're thinking uh, you have a direct pathway to, a, to a, a sterile body site that was not there previously. So. Uh, it completely circumvents uh, the body's natural defense mechanisms that, that are very effective typically. So uh, it's, that's why it's so critical that we are consistently caring for uh, these lines uh, as effectively as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So how do collapses occur, right? Uh, so uh, there's a few different recognized pathways uh, you know, for collapses to occur. First of which is the extraluminal pathway. Uh, this means that the passages are migrating along the external surface of the catheter from the skin to the entry site. Uh, this often occurs within seven days of insertion. So you're looking at these being associated with uh, insertion practices, right? Which I'll talk about in just a second. But uh, you know the catheter itself or the site being contaminated on insertion uh, is most common. You get a lot of skin redness and discharge from the insertion site and these types of infections as well. Uh, Intraluminal infections, so that's gonna be hub contamination. I, I like to think of these as uh, you know your more classic clavices that a lot of people talk about uh, or are familiar with. Uh, so intraluminal infections meaning that bacteria uh, gets inside of the lumen of the uh, actual device and migrates its way down uh, into the bloodstream. So, uh, so it migrates along the internal surface of the catheter. Um, these are more frequently in your greater than seven days uh, of use devices and uh, can also be related uh, to the interluminal colonization as well with the intermittent bacteremia. Uh, secondary BSIs, so this is not your classic CLABSI, but uh, that would be reportable, but uh, central lines can still be uh, contaminated and, and seeded with bacteria from another source in the body. So you're looking at infections at other body sites that are, that are uh, leaching into the bloodstream. You know, you're thinking of things like uh, your abscesses that are, you know, say you have a patient with an abscess as MRI saying it, it's making its way in the blood, that can also colonize that central line and uh, lead to uh, uh, you know, septicemia, positive blood cultures that just don't really clear. Uh, empty site contamination, so it's less frequent, but still important, and that's going to be the introduction of pathogens through a fluid infused through the catheter system. So it's a, it's a pre-contaminated uh, fluid, and it's you know, not to do with the actual you know, practice with the hub or anything like that. It's already there. So um, next slide, please. So, talking about indications for central venous access, uh, you know, these are critical because, uh, you know, the goal being that we're only using the right device for a clinically uh, indicated rationale. Uh, so, the, the most commonly uh, recognized rationales for use for a, a central venous access device, uh, you're looking at the administration of vasopressors or other non-peripherally compatible infusates, uh, chemotherapy or TPNs, which is your total parenteral nutrition, uh, extended course of IV antibiotics. So you're looking typically, uh, you know, this is just a recommendation, but we, we consider that to be greater than or equal to six days. Uh, support of high volume flow for therapies, such as hemodialysis or hemodynamic monitoring and critically ill patients. Um, venous access for placement of devices to your cardiac pacemakers, as well as uh, patients who have inadequate venous access. And we're thinking of things like uh, setting criteria at your facility uh, to define this, right? So uh, patients who have had, uh, uh, you know, multiple people try to access this. How? What is the expected volume of attempts on a patient? Uh, do you have that in a policy or practice? 
uh, you know, to define what inadequate peripheral venous access is. It can also be frequent phlebotomies at least eight, um, every eight hours for greater than or equal to six days. Um, you know, similar, similarly, intermittent infusions for greater than or equal to six days. Uh, I want to remind you guys to remember that midlines and ultrasound guided IV placement are your friends. Uh, you know, you when we first started embarking on our collapse improvement uh, uh, initiatives, we, you know, we wanted to look at what are the practices and what are the available skill sets at each of our facilities. And especially if you're a critical access hospital, you may or may not have people effectively trained to place ultrasound guided IVs. Uh, so, you know, that's an opportunity that you can reach out. A lot of your vendors will train you if you have equipment um, or your, your central line vendor themselves will oftentimes offer to train uh, individual staff and check them off on those. So instead of having to default to a central line of very difficult to access patients, such as your IV drug abuse patients who have exhausted a lot of their venous access points, uh, you know, you can use ultrasound and get a lot of those. And so whenever you're looking at your at your practices, uh, I put up here an example of uh, when we first started this process where we you know did a system wide one year analysis of, of rationales for central line placement and usage. Uh, you know, we wanted to look at this and you might be surprised at what you see, right? So, uh, you know, we see the IV antibiotics right at the top, um, you know, but really the big one that stuck out to me was difficult venous access, right? You know, there are so many, you know, it, that were being used uh, just for that reason alone. So we've embarked on a, on a major push across our system to, to increase the training and equipment availability. Um, so do they have the tools to actually meet the ask if you, if you ask them to reduce central line usage? Do they have that ability even with their equipment and and skill set and training? So you know you can you can make the ask and push the idea, but you have to support with the uh, with the other components of the role. So uh, point being, you know, doing that analysis, you may be surprised at what you find. Next slide, please. So proper insertion practices. So you you gotta get started off on the right foot when it comes to uh, these lines. Um, you know, and the CDC provides some great guidance on insertion practices. Uh, you know, basically, you know, performing hand hygiene for insertion, you know, here at Jake's Epic Technique and critically, uh, max, using the maximal sterile barrier precautions. So that's going to be your mask, cap, gown, sterile gloves, and sterile full body drapes uh, in a dedicated space for placement. Uh, you know, choosing the best insertion site to minimize infections and non-infectious complications. So that's going to be sometimes based on the individual patient characteristics, but generally, if, if all things are perfect, which we know that doesn't always happen in healthcare, but uh, the general recognized safest location would be the subclavian site. Uh, you know, prepare the insertion site with uh, with chlorhexidine and alcohol uh, with alcohol, and uh, place a sterile gauze dressing or a sterile transparent semi-permeable dressing over the insertion site, and uh, ultimately using a chlorhexidine impregnated dressing um, for those uh, central lines. Next slide, please. So, you know, data is your friend when it comes to driving improvement, right? I mean, uh, you know, we can look at our sites and feel like that we have a pretty good idea of what the, the highest frequency site selected is. Uh, but uh, until you generate the data, uh, it's going to be hard to initiate change, especially with providers. They're like, they want to see the information, the data. And, you know, being that we're a large system, we have the, uh, the, the I guess, the opportunity and the resources to really look at uh, individual site-specific comparisons. And you'd be surprised, you know, just how much they vary from site to site. I and mean, this can be for a number of reasons, but like, for example, uh, facility one here, you know, we're looking, yeah, they had a lot of pick lines because they have a pick line team, which uh, the other site facility two did not have. So they had a lot of upper arms. Uh, but uh, also when you look at some clavian, it was the lowest uh, selected site of all, uh, when, especially when it comes to your uh, non-pick selected uh, uh, sites. So. Uh, but with facility two, you see we had a huge number of IJs and subclavians, uh, so we had a totally different issue with each site. So well, the point being here is you got to collect the data and do that analysis. But ev everybody's approach or issues are going to be different because each facility is going to have a different composition of, of physician skill. Uh, you know, are they up to date with best practice guidelines and evidence based practice? Uh, but you know, you have to know where you start at and to to really target your interventions. Next slide, please. So uh, handle and maintain central lines properly. So that's a huge one, especially with a lot of these uh, longer term place lines. Uh, you know, we have some LTAC sites now. Uh, so we're you know, really understanding that uh, how, how you take care of a line over time can really influence the duration of use before there are complications. So, uh, you know, the basics of, of maintaining a central line appropriately and caring for it, uh, obviously it's gonna be hand hygiene. I wouldn't be an infection preventionist if I didn't say it every time. Uh, you know, bathing ICU patients over two months of age with a CHG prep on a daily basis, daily CHG bathing. Uh, you know, scrubbing the hub, 
you know, that's been a, uh, a major initiative for a number of years, but it can't be uh, understated that it's still highly valuable. Uh, using only sterile devices to access catheters, uh, you know, immediately replacing dressings that are wet, soiled, or dislodged. So we're saying dressings that are not clean, dry, and intact. Uh, perform routine dressing changes using aseptic technique with clean or sterile gloves, uh, ideally sterile gloves. Uh, changing your administration test for continuous infusion no more frequently than four days, but at least every seven. And uh, if blood or blood products or fatty emulsions are being administered, changing that tubing every 24 hours. Next slide, please. Always enjoy this chart. This is uh, you know heavily used. Um, you know, you may be familiar with it, but uh, it's a great way to uh, to provide a very concise listing of some of the modifiable risk factors, meaning things that you really can can be changed by uh, your facility effectively and um, uh, for a central line infection. So you know we're looking at things like insertion circumstances. So lines that are placed in emergent scenarios and suboptimal conditions, uh, you know, those those lines should not remain. And you should check your facility, and make sure you have a policy and a practice that uh, that gets those lines out effectively. Uh, skill of the inserters, you know, you, you always want people who have uh, are specialized or have uh, effective competencies too, uh, versus general uh, in skill sets. You know, insertion sites. You know, there are, there are certain insertion sites that um, are in closer proximity. To, to high microbial load areas in the body, like the femoral site. Uh, so it's always going to introduce more risk. You know, the, the, what you use for skin antisepsis. So ensuring sure that you're looking at your products that you're using currently when you're evaluating uh, your program. So uh, multi-lumen catheters. So you got to think when you, the, if one central line is a risk, more than one central line is a risk, even higher, right? Uh, so if you have a, say, a triple lumen catheter placed in a patient, you essentially got three central lines there that, that all need to be, uh, uh, maintain so you have three times the risk. Uh, duration of catheter use. So the you know one of the, the number one and basically the top strategy for preventing a central line infection is is getting those uh, uh, lines out as soon as possible and no longer indicated. Uh, as well as the use of your barrier precautions, which often often happens in your emergency scenarios, uh, where you'll find they were in submaximal barrier precautions when the line was placed. Next slide, please. So keys being, you know, you need to look at your improvement initiatives from a stepwise uh, process, right? Uh, you need to understand, you know, do you have an issue and what is the scope of your issue? And is your so knowing the, if your data is accurate is critical at the very beginning because you say uh, one thing that we noticed is that as we implemented central surveillance, because there's a variance in the application of NHSN rules and guidelines, you'll find that uh, uh, you, you may see a change in your data as, as you go. Uh, whenever you look to uh, make this push to ensure data integrity. Uh, so, you mean, so you need to know exactly what the scope of your issue is when it comes to uh, you know, the volume of your negative outcomes or your central line infections. Uh, then, of course, you need to confirm your best practices. So evidence-based best practices. So looking at uh, your major uh, bodies like uh, CDC, APIC, uh, SHEA, those and the like, AHRQ uh, is great. Uh, ensuring that your policies and processes are up to date. Uh, so you want to evaluate your care processes, you know, looking to see that you have competencies, you know, yearly for insertion and continue care maintenance for your staff uh, and providers. You know, and look at your specimen collection practice. You know, you want, one of the things that uh, you, you may find is that the, because of the LCBI1 definition, uh, you may run into instances where you have false positive class reporting due to contaminants. Uh, you know, spe you, well, what's the national, I can't remember exactly what the national average is for uh, uh, blood culture contamination rates, but uh, if it's one out of 50, right, uh, that's that's too many. You may find yourself with a uh, with a class that you have to claim, but you didn't necessarily do. Um, so that it has a tendency to cloud your data if your specimen collection practices aren't up to, up to date and effective. Um, also include those modifiable risk factors as previously discussed and the rationale for both placement and continued use. And with that rationale, you want to validate it daily uh, to ensure that it's appropriate. Uh, and we like to have our IPs go out and during our daily audits, you know, we're looking at those uh, invasive devices and, uh, you know, we're reporting anything and, and really pushing to have devices removed that are no longer indicated. Uh, you know, these much like catheters, which Justin will discuss in a minute, uh, these invasive devices are very convenient for staff. So they're more likely to try to leave them, <laughs> leave them in a little bit longer than are necessary. And, uh, you know, one of the key things we can do as IPs is to get those out and facilitate that process until it becomes a practice at your facility. Uh, engaging your providers and staff. So you want to gain added insight and foster ownership. You know, I can't say that enough. Your providers can can really make or break uh, any of your major improvement initiatives with invasive devices. 
So you want to get them involved, you know, allow them to have input. Uh, you know, that's how you, that's how you, um, you know, really push change management is you got to, you got to, you know, have them have buy-in and really understand the impetus for change and why it's needed. Uh, communicating data effectively, and this is uh, underrated sometimes, uh, you know, you need to have data communication in a process uh, that is effective, that, that everyone can really understand and interpret uh, whenever you're sharing it, because if they're stuck, confused about how to interpret what you've told them, or it's not quickly intuitive, you may find that, that you've gained, you garner less support over time uh, or less recognition of a need for improvement. Next slide, please. So focusing on processes, right? Uh, you know, we can look at outcomes all day long, but what really are we? Are, are we? we are infection preventionists. So um, we really need to be monitoring processes before we're, we're, we're really seeing infections or, or really, you know, doing RCAs is not really a, pr a primary improvement practice. Uh, you know, a lot of people wait for an infection, do an RCA, and then go back and, and to try to address the problems that they find. But ultimately, you have to implement process monitors, uh, meaning that we're looking at all of the things that are evidence-based uh, that, uh, that really contribute to providing risk for, for an infection. So what do we, we monitor things that are, that are leading to infections or the lack of doing them will lead to infections. And the thing, too, is that when you're communicating this information, Clapsies, you know, staff sometimes feel detached from that measure, right? Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not as tangible as whenever I, you know, grade a, a nurse on her basic care that she, has, she does every day. Uh, you know, that, that feedback is much more tangible and, and is, is oftentimes more effectively received than your unit had a clapsy, right? Uh, next slide, please. So what we did at the beginning, uh, we looked at, uh, we did a report card, right? You know, we, we decided that, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we needed to focus on the basics, you know, the basics, uh, because we saw things where, you know, there all the myriad of reasons I won't go into from the pandemic about why we saw process degradation. But, uh, you know, we, we focused on the basics. We, we give a report card and the report card dialed in on uh, the processes associated with prevention. Uh, so you can see I have a box in here, central line compliance. Uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, like I said, those evidence-based practices, and you know, we say it's all or nothing, right? You fail an audit if anything is not exactly as it is intended to be. Um, you know, we give this back to the the uh, units. This is a unit-specific report, as well as we have facility-specific reports, and we distributed this in a transparent way across our organization, so everybody knew it. We required this thing to be posted up in units, uh, almost like how the health department posts say a scoring system uh, based on their inspections. Uh, we, we wanted people to really understand and see this, make it visible. Uh, and the first time we rolled this out, you know, because there's a guttural reaction to a letter grade score, you know, I guess we have that ingrained in us from from youth and school. Uh, people would call me up my phone all day long when these things would get released, and I would say, "Why am I really rated an F on Central Line Care? We're not an F facility, or I've never got an F in my life." I'm like, "Okay, so so let's change it." But so uh, you know, really communicating data in simple and effective ways. Uh, it, it drives change. Next slide, please. So what we did know is that uh, that process only got us so far. Uh, so about six months in, we kind of plateaued. We saw major improvements right off the bat and major reductions in infections, but we, we still had remaining uh, infections at some of our facilities. Uh, and so we reached out and, and reached out to the stakeholders that are receiving these reports. And what we got back was we need more specifics. So uh, we went from just you know a basic central line care audit to a CLABSI prevention score. Uh, so we gave them uh, you know, compliance rates by department from auditing on a daily basis, their line usage rates for each unit. We also give them a breakdown of the fail points about why those individual uh, units uh, in your facility overall were failing so they could target their improvement initiatives on the actual components of prevention uh, processes that, that are failing versus just going at it with a broad approach on every single component and just doing edu education, right? Uh, next slide, please. And so with that process is drive outcomes. So, I mean, uh, this is an example from our data, uh, CLABSIs, total infections uh, versus our audit compliance, they really exhibit an inverse relationship. Uh, as our audit compliance uh, increased, you know, our central line infections decreased. You know, the, the uh, evidence-based practices work. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin to talk a little bit about uh, catheters, urinary catheters. 
Hey everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for sharing your lunch with me and um, let's jump into it. So on this one, you will actually see what we've done uh, within ARH and I'm going to give you a bit of personal experience mixed with the best practice and how we applied it. Uh, go ahead and give you some of the pitfalls that, that we hit too so we can just share that experience to go ahead and jump through. Uh, based on our RCAs, the majority of our issues or CAUTIs came from three main priorities, utilization, maintenance, and collection. And on the left here, you'll see that those are split out. So examples of utilization would be the frequency of use, the appropriateness of the de device selected, and the appropriateness of the rationale that was used. Uh, the maintenance would be our bedside care bundles, uh, the removal of that device once it replaced, and then the protection of those closed systems, which Whenever you get out on the unit, you'll really see some things that you think are really ingrained, maybe not so much. We'll talk a bit more about that here in just a second. And then the collection. Uh, collection was one that was very surprising to me uh, with the nursing background. I know, you know, put the specimen in the cup, give it to the lab, let them do what they need to do. But as infection preventionists, what we really started to dig into um, was how appropriate that needs to be. So that was a bit of a shift for me, and I'm, we'll, we'll go through that. And then diagnostic stewardship. So. Uh, as we move forward, just think about your own facility and the issues, if you have them or your processes that currently exist and see how many of these you can actually apply to yourself. Um, be interested to see at the end how many of you think that this can apply. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to start with uh, the building blocks, right? Any device that's in, we want to make sure that it's there for the appropriate reason. Um, excuse me. So with that, we chose the HRQ rationale validation. So as you go down through here, you're going to see some very common ones, acute urinary retention or obstruction, um, assistance in severe sacral wounds, perineal wounds, um, hospice, comfort care, palliative care, uh, required strict immobilization for trauma or surgery, and then I hear it, uh, measurement of urinary output in critically ill patients. So I also want to point out that in parentheses, it says in intensive care units. Um, I point that out. It'll, it'll, it'll be important later. And indwelling urinary catheters are not indicated for. So there's a list here. Um, HRQ does provide that, and whenever these slides go out, there's a link at the bottom, so anyone in here, uh, you can just click the link. Uh, it will take you straight there, and it will give you, there are some caveats. Uh, the one that I find the most common in our facility is that of morbid obesity. Uh, it says some exceptions there, and there's very detailed guidance about how uh, those patients may qualify or situations that, that you may encounter that may move that from the not indicated for to the indicated for portion. Um, those could be things like you know, lift assist and uh, um, the availability of staff um, or certain certain items that you may have in your facility. Um, next slide, please. So moving from indwelling, it's also important to know what our alternatives are, right? If we don't want everybody to have an indwelling catheter, uh, we need to also have indications for our intermittent straight catheter. So those can be done through protocols or policies, standing orders, whatever it may be uh, with your providers. And that's important to really build that relationship. Uh, James had mentioned buy-in before. So, you know, whenever you involve your providers, your physicians, your mid-levels, um, whoever your policy writers are or whoever your stakeholders are in those processes, it makes them feel uh, like they own a piece of it. And as many of us know, if we own something, we're more likely to protect it and make sure it works, right? If our name's on it and it was collaborative, then it's, then it's I, I guess, more personal. Um, but with our external catheters, there, there are a lot of indications that most people overlook um, as to why they may be able to use. Uh, our most frequent here are those 24 hour urine samples that can't be collected uh, by other means. You know, our stage three or four unstageable that, that could uh, be treated with, um, you know, say an external catheter um, of, of whatever type it may be. So I included this list. It's, it's pretty extensive and I'm not gonna eat up a whole lot of time going through it, but again, it will be provided um, as a resource for you uh, to go ahead and take a, a, a deeper look at. So next slide, please. So digging into our specifics here, uh, we started to audit what devices we use. And you'll see that that dark blue one is our indwelling devices, our um, straight catheters, in and out catheters, intermittent straight cathing are the purple one. And then that light blue one that you see uh, is very, very minimally used or was, was uh, and it's starting to come up, is our external catheters. So I, I really want to, to push and, and kind of slide this one out there to you guys that just because you know it's in your facility doesn't necessarily mean that everybody does. 
And just because the vendor came in and did an education or the nurse managers have given an education or it's went out doesn't necessarily mean that with the pandemic turnover and with the amount of folks in your facility that it doesn't require um, another intervention, right? Um, so just based on what we have here uh, with the reduction that you see, uh, you're looking at about 700 down to about 650 so that uh, it doesn't look like a huge shift over the course of a few months, but those are those are actual orders, um, and that's about 100 orders less between August and November that were being ordered, and that's continued to plateau down as we continue. So it's important to really make sure that you speak with those providers, let them know what you have, let them know what the expectation is, let them know about your initiatives. Next slide, please. So on our maintenance portion, uh, as you had saw with central lines before uh, in the Clabsic presentation, you can see what we actually check for here. Uh, within ARH, and those are numbered one through seven, if you want to go ahead and read over those. And as you can see, it is pass fail. So if any of those are not met, you receive um, a failing grade. All of those do, do flow back out to the report cards, and then communication was a was a huge part of our initiative that, that really made it happen. Um, so whenever you're taking things away from this presentation, it's that not only do you have the information and that you're applying the information, but you're communicating the, the information, because without the communication, there's no room for change. Um, some, some key takeaways would be your staff competencies. Uh, whenever we started interviewing staff and, and we've done this at, you know, 14 different facilities now, you'd be surprised the difference in your uh, education between your staff or your competency between your staff on insertion. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be all indwellings. That can be the use of external catheters as well. Um, you know, some people you'll go up to and you'll talk to them about an external catheter and they're like, ah, oh, those don't work, right? Well, do they not work because they don't work? Do they don't work because there's a bit of a knowledge deficit there? Um, there have been instances where that that bit of education can really make the difference. And those people that were the naysayers, you know, you convert those and they absolutely love them. Their patients love them. It's easier to take care of. There's less maintenance. There's less hassle from IP and, and all of those things are great. So looking for those types of opportunities and those 1% improvements really make a huge difference throughout the entire facility. Um, another one that I have to have to really recommend is reviewing the IFU on all of your uh, pieces of equipment. Um, I know that that one seems pretty straightforward as IFUs are something that anybody in quality and infection prevention live from, right? Those are those are our, our sacred texts and we like to read those and say, no, it's not in the IFU, we can't do it. But so for catheters, I myself am guilty, never read one. I've been a, a nurse for ages, I knew how to put it in, I knew what I was doing, I was, I was big smart and nobody was gonna change my mind. But we read it, turns out based on the IFU, uh, whenever you look at the catheter bag, timed and dated on there, that was a part that added from that IFU. And it ended up being important in one of our following, um, in one of our following or upcoming slides. So next slide, please. Um, urine collection methodology and stewardship. There's a lot of experience to be shared here. Uh, for the group out there, I'm gonna ask a question and it's how many of you have actually reviewed your order sets? Those specifically requiring those auto reflex the culture orders. And if the answer is that you have not, uh, that's something that I would definitely recommend uh, whenever you're embarking on your cardiac prevention journey. Uh, because whenever we did it, we started with the emergency room and most all of our order sets had a UA reflex to culture. Uh, my favorite one is our snake bite order set that was just a UA uh, that would automatically reflex the culture. You know, we, we knew the source, we knew that it was a snake bite. We, uh, we were, weren't, weren't looking for anything specific, but it was there. And it was on, uh, uh, I wanna say about 30 or 50 standing order sets. So that in itself uh, cut down on our culture volume, which led to our false positives and let us really focus in on what our collection practices were. Um, collection practices is our next bullet point. And whenever we talk about collection practice, I don't mean from a nursing standpoint of knowing how to appropriately collect from an aspiration point, right? Like we know that we're gonna be disinfecting that port. We know that we're gonna be hooking up to it. We know that we're going to be uh, clamping at certain intervals and we know that we're gonna be pulling um, that urine out for a cup. What I'm talking about specifically is how long has that Foley catheter or, or indwelling catheter been in place before we pull that specimen? So, um, most of the guidance that you run across here in the IDSA there, which I have linked, will tell you that anything over 24, 48 hours, whenever you're culturing that catheter, that urine, what you're actually getting is the biofilm or buildup in, inside of that catheter. And much like those collection practices that resemble our CLABSI efforts, our CAUTI efforts do the exact same. So what we're doing is actually culturing the inside of the bag. 
versus what is coming from the patient. And that will do a whole lot of things for your facility. It will increase your length of stay. It will damage your antibiotic stewardship data. It will, of course, give you the CAUTI, which we are here to prevent today. And, um, you know, there's a whole there's a whole lot of stuff for the patient. So that that one's a big one. If there's any you take away from anything that I've said to you today, I would I would definitely say look at your your collection stewardship, and setting those expectations of lim and limitations, empowering your laboratory to be able to reject those specimens if they know that they're not correct, um, and you know, getting your transport media, uh, your storage, and your collection times down pat as far as processes go. Next slide, please. So continued interventions. Um, I've underlined accountability and ownership here, because to me, that's one of the most important. Um, a lot of these interventions, you'll see nurse driven protocols, HRQ mentions, physician champions, most every bundle that you look at will tell you to find a provider champion or physician champion. Um, but there, there's, there's some costs that uh, you don't really know, uh, or things that you don't recognize that, that, are, that are important if you don't have them, and that's things like administrative buy-in and provider buy-in. If you're in a facility that you have those, great. It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, if you're in a facility, uh, a facility that does not, uh, once you start to get those, it's it's marvelous how much smoother everything runs. Um, education is a very important component. Understanding that everyone learns at different speeds, uh, they learn different ways. So getting those out in all sorts of different um, media are important. So some for flyers, some inpatient, some just in time training, uh, and those communications. You know, we rely heavily on a lot of automated processes uh, for those communications to just for the sheer volumes of these that we're doing, and then. Um, those stop orders will, will really will really you know cut down on a lot of your your long term use catheters um, and and getting those out of there or at least prompting it for a reevaluation. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our catheter uh, maintenance evaluation. What you'll see here is our data actually from ARH um, with our fail points broken down. This is just a combination of our CAUTI specific fail points for the year, and it shows you trends and you can identify pretty well what facility uh, is having an issue with what some of those that you'll see peak are changes in items some of those are changes in staff due to agency turnover and it lets us keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on in our facilities to be able to drive the improvement and continue that improvement next slide please um, again, this is the IP report card. This is the CAUTI version of the CLABSI one that James had discussed before. Uh, this was a request of our nursing staff that did come from um, that communication part. It wasn't just A, B, C, D, or F, but they wanted more, more actionable data uh, to be able to function with. And this is a this is a live example, you know, of what our fill points were, what we could do with it. You know, for example, catheter not indicated. Um, that one comes a lot from the nurses will tell us, hey, this person has acute ear hypertension. But as infection preventionists, we take it a step further. We review the documentation ourselves. Um, we, we go into the chart, we look for documentation, we discuss with the provider, and then we'll find out, hey, this person does not actually have retention. So going in and verifying what the nurses are saying versus or verifying that it's true what they're telling you versus what they're what they're believing is true um, is very important and helps focus in on that education part as well. Um, next slide, please. And um, we actually have some more live data here. I'm going to give you back to James, but thank you all for your time. Yeah, uh, just real quickly, uh, you know, we're running up on time. Uh, you know, this is an example of our NHS and national percentile ranks in our critical access hospitals. You know, we, we started this uh, focus on catheter reduction really in, in January of 22 for our critical access facilities. Uh, you know, we started around the 96th percentile. Uh, you know, finished off uh, as of November at the 20th percentile, uh, which, you know, it really equates to about a 55% reduction over an overall catheter usage. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, uh, in our acute care hospitals, you know, we, we really started our initiative there uh, in January of 23, uh, doing the same things that we saw in, effective in our critical access facilities, uh, starting at around the 90th percentile for catheter usage. Uh, and really, I, it's not on here, but in December, we actually hit the 21st percentile in our acute care hospitals for catheter usage. And, and what this all really equates to uh, is uh, a, a predicted reduction in about 30,000 catheter days across our system uh, for uh, 24. Next slide, please. And uh, of course, you know, what would be different infections? Uh, you know, this is our CLABSI and CAUTI together uh, as a system. And uh, really, the, the focus on our auditing processes started in quarter one of 23, uh, major reductions immediately, and then continued and sustained reductions through quarter four. Next slide, please. 
And I also want to, want to give one point. Uh, you know, there's a lot of guidance out there in classic and cardiac prevention, but uh, you don't, in, as well as C diff, right? So, but you don't always see MRSA bacteremia prevention guys. I think there's one out there right now that I've seen. There may be more uh, now, but historically there haven't been. But realistically, your your C prevention practices are, you know, what you what you find there is often um, indicative of the overall care of vascular devices in your facility. So vascular access device. So that could be your peripheral IVs, midlines, things like that. And whenever you're bringing up the standard of care in one, you'll bring up the standard in the others uh, by nature. And uh, we saw our MRC bacteremia drop, uh, I think as a system overall, we're looking at about 85% uh, over the course of a year. Uh, but that's all uh, we have. Uh, you know, any questions, you guys can feel free to reach out to us or, or post them in the chat. We're more than willing to respond and answer. Uh, but I appreciate everybody coming out and letting us uh, Talk at this lunch and learn. All right. Thank you all so much. That was great. So, as you can see on the screen, we have our contact information. Um, the team that are from Appalachian, they have really done a really great job. So, if anyone has a question, is there any question on the chat? Or you can also contact us via email. But there's no questions in chat. Oh, no question. Okay. We want to really take this time to thank our, our team for making the time to be able to come here and present their best practices. And we hope everything they have shared will be able to, you'll be able to use that information and disseminate in your various facilities. These slides will be available, including the recordings. Um, within the next seven days. Um, so thank you all so much and have a great day.